Peace be upon you all, and welcome to another Seeing God in Biology uh, episode with Dr. Faz Rana. Uh, Faz, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Ahmed. How are you? All is well, and uh, today is a very exciting uh, topic, uh, everyone. It is about EVs, which stands for endogenous retroviruses, and it is um, proclaimed as one of the maybe... Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, for us, best evidence for evolution mm -hmm. and specifically even used for uh, human evolution um, in particular. So it is a very um, controversial topic. Not so many people um, talk about this one, but who can talk about this one to us better than Dr. Fazrana? Because this is, you know, something in the DNA, right? Yes, exactly. And, um, you know, we're going to take a, an approach to discussing endogenous retroviruses that hopefully is much different than what many people have seen uh, and experienced when they have explored this whole topic, if they have. Uh, yeah. but, but as you mentioned, and many people see endogenous retroviruses and their presence in the human genome as well as the genomes of other organisms as really compelling evidence for common descent. And I can see why people would say that. Uh, but what we have learned in the last three or four years, and the, and the discoveries continue to pour in in recent, in recent months, that ERVs actually play a critical functional role uh, in the genome. And uh, when we think about that functional role, it allows us to actually present another explanation for ERVs that is compatible with an intelligent design or with a creation model approach. In fact, I'm going to make the point that if I was going to design uh, the human genome or the genome of any organism in such a way to protect it from, uh, from retroviral infections that I would incorporate elements just like endogenous retroviruses into the genome. So we're gonna be taking a, a design perspective on endogenous retroviruses and in some respects, you could see this episode as being a sequel or a companion to a, an earlier episode that we recorded and aired uh, on the design of pseudogenes, where yeah. many people also would say the distribution of pseudogenes in the human genome and the genomes of other organisms reflects evidence for common descent. So these are two companion episodes that really are trying to, to make the, the very same point. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, let's go to the uh, to the presentation and and see where this gets us. And maybe even we'll have some discussions about whether we can see some relations between what you're going to explain to us and what is actually the human practice in, in human engineered systems, where, mm -hmm. uh, um, for example, like computer viruses and what we do to protect our systems from them or something. Let's let's see if we can find a similarity. Yeah, that'll be that. that'll be fun. It's it's always your your insight always. Uh, it, it, it astounds me and uh, and um, and and uh, informs me. I, I always learn a lot by spending time with you. So hopefully this is no no exception. But you know, I, there could very well be a lot of viewers that have no concept of what endogenous retroviruses are. So the first thing to do is really explain to people what they are, mm -hmm. and that will set the stage for our discussion. And yeah. it all begins, of course, with uh, the Human Genome Project, mm -hmm. uh, which you know, in which the the first draft of the Human Genome was published in June of 2000, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. and shortly after the the Human Genome was published, people began to analyze the sequences, the sequence elements, uh, and the question was, what were the number of genes in the Human Genome? What was the percentage of the Human Genome that was functional? And in very short order, people concluded that somewhere between two to five percent of the human genome consists of functional DNA elements, where about two percent of the human genome encodes for protein products. And the, the view was the rest of the genome is essentially non-functional DNA that was accrued over a, a vast evolutionary history that the that these non-functional sequences reflect uh, essentially events that introduced these non-functional sequences in the genome or modified functional sequences rendering them non-functional 
and that they are not only they are in effect the vestiges uh, of, a, of an evolutionary history. And so this is the type of diagram that you would see uh, people publishing where they would produce a pie chart with the different percentages of different types of se sequence elements. And again, mm. concluding that most of the human genome is non-functional. Yeah. Uh, here's a, another type of another type of uh, pie chart that you might see as well, where the the categorization is between what are called transposable and non-transposable elements. And we'll yeah. talk a little bit about what a transposable element is in a minute. But notice that eight percent of the human genome consists of what are uh, dubbed endogenous retroviruses. And oh. these are believed by many biologists to be the leftover remnants of retroviral infections, where the retroviral DNA has been incorporated into, in this case, the human genome, and is now retained in the human genome as, as a history or a vestige of, uh, of again, retroviral infections. And... Oh. Um, and which, so, which, which of all of those colors is what 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 people um, consider as functional DNA? Let's say. Uh, I'm not quite sure in this particular diagram uh, what that what I don't think that is actually um, that that's actually uh, communicated in this diagram. Mm -hmm. This one is is distinguishing between. Uh, what are called transposable and non-transposable elements. So presumably the functional DNA, uh, if you're looking at it primarily as genes or DNA that is involved in directly regulating you know, gene activity, would be in the non-transposable portion of the chart. Mm -hmm. So it would be in that, that light blue or that blue, that dark mm -hmm. blue area that maybe is about 60% or so of the genome. But that would again, constitute two to 5% of the total genome, or, you know, maybe uh, four to, to four to 10% of that, that 60%. Yeah, so it's, uh, the way I remember it is that the, the, the coding genes, the 25,000 genes, human genes, if I recall the number correctly, is like one and a half to 2% of the total 3 billion yes. base pairs or something, yes. which is even a small part of the untransposable so, so, so does that mean that like 98% plus of the human genome is something that we don't really understand what it's there for? Well, that, that's the, that's the assertion or <clears throat> from an evolutionary perspective, we would say, or people yeah. would say that, uh, we, we understand <clears throat> what it's there for. And it's simply there because of, you know, the, the haphazard evolutionary history where different biochemical events introduced um, introduced these genetic elements into the genome and they are just simply retained uh, because of their physical association with functional uh, regions of the genome. So that would be yeah. largely the argument, right? Yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's, it's quite astonishing me that this argument exists because the reason is that if 98 point something percent of the human genome is there as, you know, like sort of rubbish or trash or garbage or uh, um, previous artifacts or ruins of previously existing things or destroyed genes that are not more functional. It means that the cell is spending 98% of its energy replicating nonsense, which is according to the very assertions of the evolutionary theory, would say that thus, such a cell should not exist actually, that the human cell should not exist because it's consuming 100% units of energy, 98 point something percent of it is thrown away. And under any competitive kind of analysis, this human that has this amount of noise should not exist. Versus other humans that using the same evolutionary approach should reduce this just to the one and a half or 2% that are functional. And they just have a very much shorter genome and that's it. Shouldn't, shouldn't this be a direct conclusion of the evolution? theory itself, or, or am I mistaken in that? No, you're, you're not mistaken. And I would make a, a similar argument hmm. uh, because, in fact, when people have done in vitro evolution experiments or have monitored the evolution of microorganisms in the lab, one of the things you note is that 
those organisms will tend to streamline their genomes. They will, over time, begin to jettison no, sequences that are non-useful. In fact, there are, are bacteria that uh, be, become internal parasites in cells, and they can mm. live off of the host cell's biochemistry, and they have among the smallest genomes in nature. And the argument is many of these genes are not necessary when they're residing permanently within the cytoplasm of a, of a host cell because the host is providing all of that biochemical support. So we have these observations, we, these experimental results that essentially are, are affirming your, your intuition. And so the question is, why isn't that happening, not just simply in humans, but for all eukaryotic organisms? You would actually expect, and, and, you're, and you're right, that to the replication of a huge genome that is non-functional is not, not only cumbersome and slow, but it, it is also an energy intensive, resource intensive uh, process. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, what I'm feeling is that the argument of the evolutionary theory from the front door is, is like counter intuitive, or actually counter to its own arguments. But um, so it's, it would not only be the, the case for the 8% of the ERV part, but for the whole 98 plus thing that they're saying is there because it is uh, artifacts of evolution, while according to evolution, it shouldn't exist at all. So uh, it's either you have your cake or, or, or you eat it. You don't have them both, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so then let's uh, get into a little bit more detail about hmm. what uh, endogenous retroviruses are, or at least what they're believed to be. And this is a, a, a cartoon uh, that uh, displays or, or tries to communicate the retroviral life cycle. And like, uh, you know, most viruses, retroviruses consist of a protein capsid, which is shown there as the green uh, octahedral type of structure or dodecahedral type of structure there. Hmm. And then it's a hollow capsid. Uh, and so inside is genetic material. In the case of retroviruses, it would be a single strand of RNA. Also mm -hmm. in that space are uh, copies of enzymes, uh, reverse transcriptase, protease, and, a, and an enzyme called integrase. And then surrounding that uh, dodecahedral uh, structure would be uh, a lipid bilayer uh, that has these proteins called envelope proteins uh, protruding from the, the, from the bilayer. And those mm. proteins serve as an, an attachment point with the host cell surface. The host cell will produce proteins that will be on its surface uh, that uh, perform functions for the, for the, the host organism. And um, these viral uh, envelope proteins will recognize certain host proteins and bind to it. And that binding event will then trigger uh, other biochemical events that cause that viral capsid to become engulfed by the cell. And then once inside the cell, that capsid will essentially break down. There's a variety of mechanisms by which it breaks down. And what's released is the uh, RNA molecule along with the reverse transcriptase enzyme and the protease and the integrase enzymes. Now, the, the, the reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that can convert RNA into DNA. And so what happens is that, that uh, viral RNA gets converted into DNA, and then the DNA can be read uh, by the host machinery and can be transcribed to produce uh, viral RNA molecules. And some of those molecules will then make their way to the ribosome where the ribosome will read that genetic information, producing the proteins needed to assemble the viral capsid, as well as other proteins like reverse transcriptase and integrase and protease. And that becomes encapsulated in the protein capsid along with the RNA molecules, the, the viral RNA. And then mm. it'll make its way to the, to the cell surface through the Golgi apparatus. And the envelope proteins will be incorporated into the bilayer, and then it will then be released into the extracellular space 
where it can repeat that infectious cycle. So that right. is um, essentially what a retrovirus is doing. Now, right. the, the some, but there are occasions where that uh, the DNA that is reverse transcribed from the viral genetic material can actually be incorporated into the host genome through the activity of the enzyme integrase. And when that happens, right. that, that process is called endogenization, where the right. retrovirus is now become incorporated into the, into the genome. Now, in that endogenized state, it can be latent, where it's not expressed. It can be suppressed by the cell's enzymes, or it can actually be transcribed producing RNA molecules uh, that can then reactivate the, the infection, if you will. And so one example of a, of a, um, of a, a retrovirus would be HIV, the, the virus that causes AIDS. Hmm. And, um, hmm. and so you know, what happens is the HIV genetic material gets incorporated into the host genome, or at least the cells that it infects, and it can remain in the latent state and then be activated by some kind of trigger so that the, the HIV infection will, will rear up, will, will become activated, um, you know, as a result of that, that DNA that's incorporated into the, into the host genome. So that's essentially, the, in a nutshell, kind of uh -huh. the, the retroviral life, life cycle. Now, this diagram, let's just say we don't need to worry about the portion of the diagram on the right. But uh, the, the, well, the, 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 well, just give me, let, let's make a little pause here. Just, just for one minute, just for a minute. I need to fix something on the, on because you're cutting up just one minute. Sure. Hello. Hey there. Yeah, because you were cutting up, so I thought somebody's using the the I mean, streaming outside, and it seems the kids were doing so. so <laughs> I asked them to shut it down. <laughs> okay. So um, just to okay, back again. So just to summarize, so the retrovirus comes into the cell from, from your previous yeah, uh, comes into the cell with its own genetic material, and it it. It, it throws this into the cytoplasm and then uses the cell machinery to create um, new ones that then get packed into its packaging and is released as viruses. And is it an occasional thing that it goes into the very DNA inside the nucleus or it is a must? Um, it, I, I, I'm of the impression that it, it is an occasional thing. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily um, something that always happens. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, probably happens with enough frequency that um, uh, that it that it it is a, a fairly common occurrence okay so so the matter of of uh, pushing itself through integrase into the very DNA of the cell is not necessary for the life cycle of the virus itself or for the cycle of the virus itself the virus is a living thing anyway right it, so it's, not, it's, it's not a must but it, it, it frequently occurs this is what you're saying Yes, yes. Okay, okay. And and for it to pass from one generation to another generation, because if this is just a somatic cell, then it doesn't make a difference, actually, if it gets integrated or not. Right, exactly. And so uh, okay. here's a, a diagram that uh, anticipates your, your, ah, your okay. very, good, very good point. <laughs> and let's not, we don't need to worry for this moment at, for the right-hand side of the diagram, 
we're just going to look at the the stick figures. And so mm. if if the infection is in the somatic cells, then uh, then uh, as you said, it's it's something that uh, that infection begins and ends with that individual patient. Now that mm. patient can transmit, you know, the virus uh, horizontal. It's called a horizontal transmission. Uh, you know, so if that person, you know, the virus is in the extracellular space and it, it might make its way into the, the mucus or the saliva and in that person coughs or sneezes, the virus goes into the air and then it can be picked up by another person uh, and, and the infection can be transmitted. Yeah, it's, it's essentially a whole infection. Yeah, that's, that's what yeah. horizontal transmission is. Yeah. Right. But now yeah. if, if the retrovirus infects uh, the, the germ cells, the gametes mm -hmm. or, or the gamete forming cells, uh, then it's going to actually be propagated to the next generation. Hmm. That individual's offspring, if the virus has become endogenized and has become incorporated into the genome of the gamete, can then actually be transmitted to the offspring, that individual's offspring. And that, hmm. that individual may or may not show any kind of symptoms of that viral infection. Uh, if the, the DNA is endogenized, but if it's in the latent state, mm -hmm. that person may never show any signs of the infection, but that, that, inf that the viral virus would be transmitted uh, to the next generation. So that's referred to as a, a vertical transmission. Mm -hmm. Now, and, uh, that means it has either infected an egg in the female or a sperm in the male. And in the case of the male, it needs to infect so many sperms, actually, to the right. extent that some of them would actually fertilize the egg or something. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, so then this is the, the diagram that, uh, in, 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 that illustrates why so many people think the occurrence of endogenous retroviruses in genomes reflects mm -hmm. uh, an evolutionary history. So if we go to the right-hand side of the diagram, right here, because the, the retrovirus, again, be, uh, begins as an RNA, sequ uh, an RNA sequence that then is reverse transcribed into DNA. And if that DNA becomes incorporated, again, into the genome and is actively uh, transcribed to produce more copies of the viral RNA, that RNA in turn can become reverse transcribed into DNA and can be integrated elsewhere in the genome. And that means that a once you have an endogenized retrovirus, it can then proliferate within the genome through this mechanism known as retrotranspositioning, where it, it and it's called a transposon or a retrotransposon uh, because of that, that pathway. And so you can have multiple copies of uh, of, of an endogenized retrovirus that become proliferated within the genome of an individual. Hmm. And that, uh, that endogenous retrovirus and, can and also... Is that the case because the, the, the piece that is going to jump will have in its own sequence the integrase sequence itself? So it will, yes. it will, when it's transcribed, it has integrase in it, and then the integrase will cause it to be integrated somewhere else. It needs to be the whole package, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. and, 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 um, and so uh, this diagram shows um, the viral, the retroviral genetic material. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what the, the sequence looks like. So this is kind of an idealized uh, retrovirus sequence. Uh, and you typically have these two sequences that are called long terminal repeats on the five prime and three prime end of the retroviral genome. And the Five, time, five prime long terminal repeat has promoter sequences. These are the sequences where RNA polymerase will bind to, uh, allowing for uh, the, the retrovirus to be, um, uh, once it's in the, in the DNA form, to be read by RNA polymerase to make more copies of RNA. The uh, three prime end is a trans, has transcription terminators as well as uh, sequences that lead to what's called polyadenylation, where a, a, a tail of 
uh, adenine residues are added. And this is something that's characteristic of RNA molecules uh, in eukaryotic cells. So that mm -hmm. polyadenylation is necessary for the cell's machinery to, to utilize that messenger RNA for translation and, and for other processes. Mm, and, then, right. and then there are these four genes. Uh, mm. One are, is called GAG, and it's actually a gene that encodes what's called a polyprotein. These, this is a, a protein that consists of several distinct proteins that are catenated together. Uh, and these GAG proteins are involved in the formation of the viral capsid uh, primarily. And then you have uh, the pro and the pol genes. The pro codes encodes for the protease and the pol encodes for reverse transcriptase and integrase. And then you have the ENV genes that encode for the envelope proteins. And so when uh, this retroviral DNA is uh, transcribed, you would have essentially the GAG, pro, pol, and ENV uh, genes that are all there. When it's translated, each of those individual genes will produce these polyproteins that are then cut apart by the protease into individual proteins that will then carry out their, their different activities. Uh, so this is the, the uh, retroviral uh, DNA in a nutshell. Now, when we look at the uh, human genome or the genome of other organisms, we see, um, we see essentially variations of this retroviral-like genetic material scattered throughout the genome. And so up on the, at the top is an idealized ERV sequence where in this case, they collapse the pro and the pol gene into just a single gene that they call pol here. But this is the, this is the mouse, this is a mouse uh, endogenous retrovirus labeled ERVL. And what you see here is that within the genome is this sequence where you can see what appears to be the five prime long terminal repeat uh, as uh, a three prime long terminal repeat. But notice that the ENV uh, gene is missing. And so you can have this endogenous retrovirus incorporated into the genome. But once it's inside the genome, not only can it proliferate or create copies of itself through this retro transpositioning mechanism, but it can also undergo degradation where mutations accrue or where regions of the, of the endogenous retrovirus become deleted or through recombination become broken apart and spread throughout the genome. This is another variation of that endogenous retrovirus where you have a long terminal repeat and now you have no three uh, prime long terminal repeat and you have these genes that were once believed to be the GAG and the Paul genes that are undergone significant mutational events. Here's another instance where you have, again, the long terminal repeat. And um, uh, again, you know, the, a, a degraded, uh, uh, you know, uh, sequence for the different genes encoding proteins. Sometimes the degradation is so extensive. Uh, again, this is according to evolutionary theory that all you see is a long terminal repeat in a sequence that actually is indistinguishable from a random sequence. It, there's, there, there's no even indication that there were, these were once even, uh, you know, the, the GAG or the, or the Paul or the ENV genes. And then there's some instances where all you have is uh, uh, the, the long terminal repeat that's actually associated with genes in the host cell where that long terminal repeat is functioning as a, as a regulator controlling gene expression, where it may not only has promoter sequences, but transcription factors can even bind to that long terminal repeat. Now, all of this is, are the, these types of sequences are, are found or sequence elements are found in genomes and there's different classes and categories of endogenous retroviruses that are labeled within genomes, but these are all considered to be ERVs. And so when we look at the human genome or you have 8% being an endogenous retrovirus, it's really 8% that consists of combinations of these kinds of different sequence elements uh, that, that we see. 
but again, you know, the, the, the idea here is that you, you have this, this process of, uh, of degradation happening once endogenization takes place. So that these now are believed to be the leftover remnants of a, of a retroviral infection. But when we look at the genomes of, um, let's go back here. If we look at the genomes yeah. of, of a human, yeah. we see that, that, that they're, and we compare it to those genomes of the great apes or maybe even old world monkeys, we see very similar uh, uh, ERV sequences that lo are located in corresponding regions of the genome. And so the argument goes, look, it doesn't make any sense for it to have these ERV sequences in these genomes to be distributed in the way that they're distributed, uh, unless this reflects an evolutionary history where the shared ancestor of different bio, of, of two biological groups that are believed to be related to each other in evolutionary terms, if that ancestor acquired this infection and then that infection was transmitted vertically and over time, as different evolutionary lineages diverge, those sequences are retained in genomes as, again, a vestige of not only of uh, an infectious history with that retroviruses, but of, a, of an evolutionary history. Uh, and so, so many people would, will look at, uh, again, endogenous retroviruses in these terms and argue that this becomes, again, compelling evidence for, uh, for, uh, for human evolution, right? or for yeah. an evolutionary history in general. So, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to the argument. It, it's, it seems to be a very elegant, you know, uh, explanation if you view uh, things from an evolutionary perspective. And I can yeah. see why people say, hey, based on the distribution of ERVs alone, I, you know, conclude that humans must have evolved. Now, what, what people are presuming, however, are two things. Well, actually, three things. One yeah. is that the ERV sequences are non-functional. Yeah. Two, that the insertion mechanism uh, is non-random, and that the mutational events that take place are likely non non-random. Is, or sorry, are, are random. Are random. Are random. Yeah. Sorry. Let me repeat that. So that yeah, the yeah. that ERV sequences are non-functional, mm -hmm. and that the uh, insertion events are random and yeah. that the mutational events are random as well. Now, we actually have mounting evidence that retroviral endogenization and the tr uh, retro transpositioning of endogenous retroviral elements is not a, a random process, but a non-random process where certain mm. sequences serve uh, preferentially as the insertion sites. And we have mounting evidence that mutational changes, even recombination events, are not are not random, but are non-random, where there's certain sequences that are much more susceptible to mutation than others. These are referred to as hotspots. That recombination happens preferentially at certain sequence positions. Uh, uh, so this idea that these things are uh -huh. are are uh, random actually isn't valid. But you know we're gonna we'll just set that aside for for this program. That becomes a, a whole nother conversation that maybe we can pick up at some point in time. But but the idea here is that if these events that shape the endogenous retroviruses are random and they're non-functional, then there's no then the question is why would a creator introduce non-functional sequences that are so similar to one another? in the same locations in genomes of organisms that naturally group together. That, yeah. doesn't, make, that doesn't make any sense. You know, yeah. the, the, the best explanation is that this again is a, a signature for common descent. Now, in, in the last... Um, so so ju just, just to put the argument together, the, the argument is those are artifacts that have no function uh, they are a result of infection, so they can infect the DNA in any random place. So if we find them, for example, in an ape and a human in the more or less the same places, then if this is, since it's random, it doesn't make sense that they are of both those lineages unless those lineages are actually coming from, ta-da, the same ancestor, so hence evolution. This is what they're saying. 
Right. So right. Their, their point, what we're saying is that their point stands on number one, they're non-functional. So it's an artifact. So it, it's only there because evolution. Number two, it's random. So it's the same place. The only explanation can be is because it evolved from a common ancestor. And if the transposition itself is also random, then if you find copies also in the same place, uh, given that it's random, then hence also evolution. But this is this is how they're pitching this. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. and the 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 and I'm old enough now. <laughs> uh, don't I don't like to admit it, but I'm old enough now where I can remember 20, 25 years ago, 30 yeah. years ago, where everybody was arguing that you know, endogenous retroviral elements would be, again, non-functional, that there were people that took the position, why spend a lot of time studying these sequences uh, beyond just categor categorizing them or using them as a tool to determine common ancestry to propose phylogenetic models mm. uh, that nobody really studied them. Nobody anticipated that these sequence elements would be functional. And yet uh, in the in the last you know, uh, several years, we've identified function for all the different endogenous retroviral sequences, uh, or, or, or we've, uh, we've identified a variety of different functions for endogenous retroviral sequences. Uh, and um, the, the, the discoveries for retroviral function are exploding. Uh, the, in the wow. scientific literature, new insights are just exploding as to what endogenous mm. retroviruses are doing and wow. the function that they're playing or performing is utterly dependent upon their sequence similarity to retroviruses so it's not wow. just simply that they're functional but that but that they're the um the function is predicated on again the the sequence similarity so much so that if you mm. were a designer looking to again design function uh, in the genome, it, in, in, it for uh, one of the chief functional roles is uh, serving as part of the innate immune system, providing an anti-retroviral defense. That if you were going to design that kind of defense system, you would design sequence elements that looked very similar uh, to endogenous retroviruses. So it's not just simply saying, hey, we've got counterpoints to the evolutionary model or the evolutionary assumptions but that we actually can produce a design model where there's an elegance, there is a sophistication, there is a, a, a beauty to the, to the way in which these endogenous retroviral sequences are functioning. Now, hmm. uh, but before we get into that, let's just take a second and talk about long terminal repeats because uh -huh. people very early on recognized that these long terminal repeats actually are serving a functional role in the genome uh, where they are playing a role in gene regulation, where these can function as promoters, they can serve as transcription factor binding sites. And so if we again look at the, 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 their, the structure of, uh, of the retroviral material, the long terminal repeats are serving as promoter sequences where these are serving as binding sites for RNA polymerase. It's critical for transcription uh, of that viral genetic material in the DNA format to produce the, the, again, the RNA molecules. And so if you were a designer, it makes sense that you very well could actually incorporate similarities to the long terminal repeat into genomes of eukaryotic organisms uh, because they have certain properties that make them ideally suited as promoter sequences. And if the fact that we see these long terminal repeats that are just isolated, associated mm. with host genes, uh, you know, again, it's in, interpreted in an evolutionary perspective as being a vestige of an endogenous retroviral infection. But if you take uh. a common design argument, you would say, well, these long terminal repeats just simply share design features with the, the, the promoter sequences in retroviruses and are there because they were intentionally incorporated there because they have certain design properties that, that make them useful in that particular setting. Now, mm. now, if you adopt an evolutionary explanation for long terminal repeats, 
then you would have to say that somehow this long terminal repeat sequence got, you know, disassociated from the endogenous retrovirus, which could happen through recombination events, and they simply wound up becoming associated with a particular host cell gene. But it, that association has to be at the right, just right juxtaposition for it to mm. function as a promoter. Yeah. Uh, and that, uh, that it's going to then, in that circumstance, alter the gene expression profile of that gene. And that's going to have biological consequences for the organism. So you'd have to say that you have the just right set of events that dissociate the long terminal repeat from the endogenous retrovirus, insert it or relocate it within the genome in the just right location that it can serve as a promoter, and that the changes in the gene expression profile are the just right changes to actually insert, ensure uh, survivability or even a benefit to the host organism. Now, maybe uh, that maybe that could happen a handful of times, given the yeah. size of, of the genome, you know, being 3.2, you know, 2 billion base pairs in size. But for it to happen routinely, mm. you know, and, and to be widespread, to me, begins to push the bounds of, of, of credulity. So in other words, just the similarity between long terminal repeat sequences in a retrovirus and in the genome of, of eukaryotic organisms isn't necessarily that compelling evidence for common descent. And again, it makes it makes better sense, I believe, from a design perspective, or at least it's a the design perspective is an equivalent explanation. Yeah. So what what, what you're saying is that the abundance of, of isolated LTRs can just as well be because LTRs are necessary in the genetic paradigm, not because they are they are the leftovers in the first place. They are just there because they are useful and they are useful to the eukaryotic cell just as they are useful to the virus. So it's the same designer and the designer is using the same elements between a eukaryotic cell and a virus as well. So the virus needs them, the bacterium needs them, the human needs them, whatever. So whatever is needed by that same element, uh, whoever needs the same element will have it in its genome, regardless what kind of living or semi-living creature it is. This is essentially what you're saying. Yes, exactly. That's 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 what I'm saying. And 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 you know, again, you know, evolutionary biologists would argue, well, evolution just uses whatever material is laying around and will repurpose it, will co-opt it, and reapply it. Okay, I can buy that argument. It's sometimes it's referred to as neo-functionalization, you know, mm. and I can buy that argument if it was isolated or if it was again a handful of occurrences, but it's way too frequent. Uh, how, how, how frequent is it? I, I don't have a, a handle on that. That would actually be a really interesting research question to pr to pursue. You know, I mean, it's in like tens, hundreds, thousands, or. Uh, I mean, it's it occurs with a high enough frequency mm -hmm. that th this is understood to be that, that when a long terminal repeat is seen in isolation or juxtaposed to a gene, that, that, it, that it, it's, it's a high enough frequency that it's routinely talked about yeah. as, as, yeah. A, as, as something as a that... a common occurrence. Right, yeah. But I, I don't know... That, that would actually be a re really interesting... Uh, question to, to, to research, to pursue. I, th th I'm sure that data exists. I just never thought to look at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, and I think it would also be very interesting to look at the specific features of the long terminal repeat sequence in terms of how it functions as a promoter in a retrovirus to then see what kind of advantage that would necessarily offer a host, the, you know, uh, the, a genome a eukaryotic genome where that is serving as a, a gene regulating element. So I think that would also be an interesting question to pursue too, is what is it specifically about the properties of a, of an LTR promoter that would make it so useful, you know, on, on a large scale basis. And, and is somebody trying to answer those questions 
uh, because they're important or is it still the attitude that this is just evolutionary uh, artifacts and hence not so important to really look very seriously behind them? Well, well like the first question, you know, what is the, the occurrence of LTR sequences in genomes? That would be something I would see evolutionary biologists interested in, uh, but not for the reasons you and I would be interested in. It would just be more cataloging, you know, those occurrences. Yeah. But, but the second question is a question that I don't think an evolutionary biologist would ask. Or the, that's a question that really is unique to an ID a creation perspective, because our our assumption going in is that these sequences were deliberately incorporated into the genome for functional reasons. Yeah. And so therefore, we would be interested in is what is it specifically about the, the details, the, the nuance behavior of, a, of an LTR in a retrovirus that could actually be useful in a eukaryotic genome as a gene regulatory element. And I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that, that if you ask that question, you would find these features that, that make those LTR sequences dis distinguishable in terms of their properties and their utility from other promoter sequences that we see in, in the eukaryotic genome. Amazing. And the, the matter that the, the very constituents of the virus are themselves or the so-called ERV are themselves functional to the cell. Do you have examples on that? Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, there's yes. a, a number of, of, of genes that are actually regulated by LTR sequences. And, uh, and this... not, the, not the LTR itself, but I mean the, 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 very, the very gag, pol, and end parts of the, of the virus, the other, the other set of the genetic material, of the virus um, being functional in the in the genome of, of the eukaryote. Uh, yes. We have good examples of that, yeah. Yes, yes, mm. and, and that leads me to the, to the next, and this mm. is really the, kind of the heart of the point that I wanna make. Yeah. Uh, it, and that is that we now understand that these ERV sequences are uh, playing a role in, uh, as an antiviral mechanism. And there are mm. two, two mechanisms that I've, I'm aware of that have been identified. There, there may be other mechanisms that I'm unaware of. And as I said, the, the discoveries about ERV functioning as a part of the innate immune system as a, an antiviral system are just pouring in. Uh, it's almost, it's impossible to keep track of all the discoveries that are happening in this area. Um, and, and so this is so, some, something that is, again, it, an insight that is suddenly exploding. And as more people are recognizing the function of ERVs along these lines, the more people are asking questions about ERV function along these lines. But these are at least two uh, well-established mechanisms for how ERVs serve as an antiviral role. One, is a, one of the mechanisms is it, it disrupts endogenization. So uh, what do I mean by that? This was actually discovered in koalas. Uh, koalas have um, uh, ERV sequences that I think are, are called KOV sequences. Mm. Uh, and these uh, koala uh, endogenous retroviruses can undergo retrotranspositioning. And remember, we, we talked a little bit about this, that, that you have, if you have the, the DNA for the retrovirus that is then transcribed, uh, it can then be reverse transcribed uh, and then incorporated into the into the um, host genome as a, yeah. a, a new copy of an, an existing endogenous retrovirus. So this yeah. is the mechanism of, of retrotranspositioning. Sure. And it turns out that, again, when you have an active retroviral infection, you're going to have a high likelihood of that in, uh retroviral DNA being incorporated into the host genome and then undergoing this retrotranspositioning process where that newly endogenized retrovirus can proliferate in terms of copy number throughout the genome. And of oh. course, this can cause damage to the host genome uh, and uh, really propagates the infection. So one way that you can disrupt the uh, retroviral infection is to disrupt the endogenization process. And it turns out 
that in koalas, there are these, this K, these KOV endogenous retroviruses that when the cell is infected with a retrovirus, those KOV sequences are transcribed at very high levels and they really? themselves start undergoing retrotranspositioning. And because the insertion is non-random, they will actually insert into the freshly in, uh, uh, transposed uh, um, endogenized retrovirus that is part of the active infection. Right. So in other yeah. words, as, mm -hmm. as these endogenous retroviruses are becoming incorporated into the genome, it activates the koala retroviruses that then seek out the endogenized sequences and insert within them, disrupting the sequence. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, so the, 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 the already endogenized sequences, the, the KOVs, would compete for the same insertion locations. And hence, if an infection happens in a location, the the own the the, the koala's own uh, ERV sequences will go and jump there, uh, like hitting the the virus on the head or something. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's a competing process where you're the you're disrupting the the viral endogenization process with these you know built-in ERV sequences. So if you were a designer and you said, what's how can I disrupt endogenization? Well, the way I can disrupt it is to fight fire with fire, right? Yeah. Is, is, is I'm going to incorporate elements in the genome that will become activated d when the active retrovirus is endogenizing itself. And I, if I can disrupt it through that same kind of mechanism, n now I, I offer protection. Now, to my knowledge, this has been discovered only in the koala genome, but is typically the case once this has been discovered, people will start looking for this elsewhere. And I suspect yeah. we're going to see more and more examples of, of this kind of disruption of endogenization. And wow. it very well could be that, that this is a, a defense mechanism in the human genome. Now, it, the, it, it, it reminds me of something of, of human making. If, if I'm not sure if you're going to agree that this is a good example, but for example, um, when humans find out about a disease and they want to help a population not to catch the disease, some of the solutions would be to vaccinate, right? Mm -hmm. And what vaccination is in the core is to deliver some of or all of the material of the, um, of, of the pathogen into the host before the real pathogen arrives such that the, the, this body is ready. Yeah. So, so regardless of the exact similarity of the example, the point is when you want to defend a system from uh, being attacked, what you do is that you give the system a glimpse of the attacker or the uh, fingerprint of the attacker or the signature of the attacker to the extent that when the attacker comes, it is already prepared. So I have two comments here. Maybe maybe calling those sequences ERVs in the first place is a misnomer or has some confirmation bias. Yes. Because maybe they are there by design, not by infection, not by a random infection. They are there because the same designer that created the virus also created the koala or the designer that created the virus that would infect the human also created the human. And it is giving the human an innate uh, a signature of the viruses that can attack it to the extent that when the actual virus comes, this mechanism will fire and compete with the virus so that it doesn't cause the whole species to perish. Uh, just like when we want, when we have the knowledge about something that did not use to infect humans because maybe it's jumping from animals or from an artificial thing or something, uh, uh, we will give the system of the human or the animal a vaccine to the extent that we make it ready for it. We give it an early alert. So, so, and even in computer systems, what you do when you install an antivirus on a computer is essentially that the antivirus has the virus um, binary code or, or, or the virus program. Because the, the reason that the antivirus would react to the virus is that it knows beforehand the signature of the known viruses. 
So let's assume that somebody is having a virus scan and the virus scan uh, is scanning the very program of the antivirus. Uh, it will find the signatures of the virus is there. And then somebody will say, wow, this computer is infected. But if the scanner is aware that those signatures are there as part of itself, as part of the antivirus, it will not say it's infected. It is not the virus that is there. It's the signature of the virus so that the antivirus can identify the virus when it comes and 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 and, and knock it out. So two examples that come to mind in, in this case where the virus in a computer system is already there just as a defense mechanism, actually, not because it has been already infected. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 you know, in in this particular case where endogenization is disrupted, you know what the the analogy I think with, and I don't know if if there, are, if the removal of the the virus, you know, viral software would work this way, but in a sense, it's like once you have, you know, the location of that, you know, of the virus located, you're just simply going to go and disrupt it in some way. You're going to and so in, in this case, in the in disruption of the endogenization just simply is let's find that sequence and, and insert something in there that's going to disrupt it so that it's no longer functional, right? And, and it's, it's not quite deleting it, it's, but it's, it's disrupting it. Um, yeah, what happens in computer systems, for example, is that if you, for example, know that this specific virus would infect the memory or the hard drive in this area for example some viruses would infect the boot sector of a drive for example so what you do is that you you, you have the, the the register of the signatures and you go and look in the boot sector for the virus at the specific place because the boot sector is not a random place it is a specific place uh, it is like the promoter of the hard disk it is the yes. promoter of the booting right so you would look at the boot sector in the place that the virus would place itself and you identify it by its signature, and when you find it, what do you do? You essentially overwrite it. Or you will kill its promoter. You will kill the place where the computer code will start reading it, yeah. okay? Whether by writing the piece of software or the piece of data that should be there other than the virus, or just by, by stepping over it, or just, just by writing, or just by killing, uh, wiping it off. So um, since, all what the genetic system can do is write other base pairs. It is essentially when when I want to compete on that place, I just go and write myself there. And it means that since I am the good guy, I, if I'm I'm just available in more copies, I'm not going to be hurting the genome. And since this is a somatic cell problem, it's not going anywhere. So if my genome increases in size with with, with few thousand base pairs. It's no harm versus saving the cell. So it looks like a very pretty, pretty elegant design to me. Yes, yeah. I'm in yeah. Th th there's an elegance, there's an ingenuity to that design. Yeah. And and again, if you were looking to to design that kind of protection, you know, from the onset, that's you would produce something very similar. Uh, I think something very similar to what we see in the koala genome. Now, yeah. um, now there's another mechanism, and I and I and again I think this there are probably analogies in terms of antiviral software, and that's uh, that the endogenous retrovirus produces proteins and RNA materials that essentially competitively inhibit uh, the retroviral life cycle. They per, they mm. they basically function as competitive inhibitors, and so again just to set the context. Remember that when the, the retroviral genetic material is released, uh, it is reverse transcribed into DNA, and then that DNA will produce RNA transcripts that will then go to the ribosome and produce the retroviral uh, proteins, the, the, the GAG and the ENV proteins, as well as the protease and the reverse transcriptase and the integrase, and that this these then will assemble into a viral capsid, a vir you know, a viral capsid that will then be released back into the extracellular environment, and, and so it turns out that people have discovered that when cells are infected with retroviruses, the ERV sequences in those genomes become transcribed at very high levels as well, and um, and this actually 
leads right. to a variety of ways in which that activity can interfere with the assembly of, of retroviral particles. One is that that RNA can, inter even if it's partial RNA, <coughs> can actually interact with the, the retroviral RNA through a mechanism known as RNA interference, where an RNA double helix is formed. And when really? that happens, it essentially disrupts the ability of that RNA to either be incorporated into the viral capsid or to be translated uh, at the ribosome. Uh, or that, that endogenous retroviral RNA could actually be incorporated into the capsid in place of the retroviral RNA, which means that that resulting retroviral particle will now be inept. It will be incompetent to infect another cell. Uh, the, the people have observed that the, the GAG proteins are uh, found uh, associated with endogenous retroviruses are uh, transcribed and translated. Those genes are transcribed and translated so that copies of the GAG protein from the ERV are present. But now if that GAG protein is a, a facsimile of the retroviral GAG protein, it will essentially start to assemble as part of the capsid but then we'll disrupt the, the capsid assembly process. <laughs> okay. You know, the, so the, 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 ARV, the ARV begins to impact the virus itself. <laughs> yes, exactly. It, it, it essentially, and if you, if, if it outproduces, if the ERV non-functional gag proteins outproduce the retroviral protein, the capsids will either not assemble or they will assemble in an improper, inappropriate way rendering the yeah. retrovirus non-functional. The ENV proteins, which are the envelope proteins, mm -hmm. can actually bind to the, the protein that is going to be the receptor protein for that viral infection that is the host cell protein that will be incorporated into the, into the cell surface. But if it binds internally, it disrupts the biosynthesis of the, the, recept the host cell receptor protein, preventing more viruses from infecting the cell, or it can actually make its way to the extracellular space where it just simply will decorate the, the host cell receptor proteins for the virus, preventing more viruses from infecting the cell. And so, there, so people have observed that these ENV proteins are produced at high levels during the process of a retroviral infection. So this is another mechanism where the ability of the ERV to function as, a, as part of the innate immune system is actually, um, again, predicated on it, the sequence similarity to retroviral materials, to retroviral genetic materials. Now, so it turns essentially, to, essentially, the ERV is hijacking the, hijacking the virus itself, left, right, and center. It combines it, with the viral RNA to deactivate it. Yeah. It, 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 it hijacks its envelope, it hijacks its genetic material, it competes with the machinery that are reproducing it. So it's essentially disrupting the viral life cycle all over the place. This is, exactly. This is the essence of, of what competition is. It, exactly. And, um, uh, and what's interesting is that people have discovered that this antiviral mechanism is a critical for protecting early stage human or early stage embryos. Uh, because when an embryo is in the two cell, four cell, eight cell, 16 cell stage before it implants in the uterus, it has no way to protect itself from retroviral infections. Uh -huh. And it turns out that these ERVs are expressed at very high levels in, in the early stage uh, developing embryo and it's wow. also expressed at very high levels throughout the course of the pregnancy in the cells of the placenta. And so mm -hmm. the, 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 the human embryo, which is particularly vulnerable to retroviral infections. And then once you start moving from the, from the early embryonic uh, stages to the process of, uh, to the embryo where it's beginning to uh, uh, undergo gastralization, where you have the, the different cell layers that then become different organ systems, that's when you start seeing that ERV expression shut down. Uh, and so it only is expressed for a very short period of time, but it's a critical period of time. And uh -huh. then it, 
then it actually shuts down, which is good because you want the ERVs to be normally suppressed because of the retro transpositioning mechanism. You don't want ERV sequences active all the time. You only want them activated during an active retroviral infection or at the very early stages of embryonic development, where again, the embryo is, is highly vulnerable. So there's- isn't, a, isn't, isn't this on its own making it very difficult for a retrovirus to infect the germline? Um, well, it would be very difficult for it to infect an early stage embryo, but I think yeah. you're raising a really good question. And that is how often do retroviruses actually attack germline cells? Um, yeah. be, because um, the assumption is that they do because of the the ERVs that are present in genomes that are presumably in vertically transmitted. But I don't know what frequency ERV, and in, 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 in fact, you might even argue that those gametes would have a, a special level of protection from ERV infections for the very reasons we're talking about, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking it's actually threefold. Number one, if you consider an egg, for example, in a female, so the number of eggs that a female carries is infinitesimally small compared to its total number of somatic cells. So what are the odds of an egg being infected anyway? And, and then if the egg gets infected and if ERV expression is high in, 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 in germ cells or early stage cells, even in the tiny event of an, of an egg or a sperm getting infected, then the ERV mechanism will kick and, and it will make it very difficult for this vertical transmission to, to take place in an effective rate. So um, I'm not sure if somebody is, is reconsidering the, the, the matter that the vertical transmission is, is what is really propagating this rather than a design consideration. But for, from what you are saying, so the, the very first fold is that the number of germ cells compared to the somatic cells is infinitesimally small. And then that the ERV mechanisms themselves, by the nature of what you have explained, would, would essentially make vertical transmission very difficult. And the, the, the fact that ERV transmission is, uh, sorry, ERV activation is pretty active during early stage um, seems like a mechanism to stop actually retroviral vertical transmissions, <laughs> assuming that ERVs are there because the vertical transmission seems to be like, you know, uh, self, a self-defeating argument given those recent discoveries. I'm, yeah. always, I'm always skeptical if evolutionary biologists actually go and reassess their initial assertions, but from what I'm hearing from you, it is an assertion that's worth reassessing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, another worthwhile research project, I think. Just to, <laughs> you know, but, but I think that would be a very interesting, you know, uh, question is, you know, what kind of defense mechanisms do gametes have, do germ, you know, germ cells have from retroviral yeah. infections? And, and I just actually, while we were chatting, go very quickly Googled uh, you know, the idea, do retroviruses infect gametes? And the answer was rarely. This rarely, rarely. happens, but it must because we see ERVs, you know, <laughs> so it, it's kind of a circular reasoning, right? Where, you know, it must happen because we, we, we see endogenous retroviruses that are, in sh that are shared among humans in the great apes. So it must have happened, right? Uh, or yeah, this be, is actually or, one of the things that that really bugged me in, in, in the evolutionary thinking altogether, that, that you see a phenomena or a phenomenon and 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 then you, you give an explanation. And then no matter what other evidence starts piling up, your initial explanation, because it's consistent with the evolutionary paradigm, remains the baseline and everything else gets explained in, according to it and the circular this circular logic takes really some pretty long time until it breaks down, until another alternative evolutionary explanation comes to the surface. And it's, it's, it's sort of frustrating because, um, and, 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 and the problem is that it gets coined in the nomenclature itself, 
Yes. So you call those sequences ERVs because you have asserted already that they are remnants of retroviruses and 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 the whole linguistics start playing the game. So it's it's, <laughs> it's sort of frustrating. Uh, but I think it is definitely, as you're saying, something that is worth somebody to do a research without any confirmation bias. You know, yeah. are these really the result of vertical transmission or vertical transmission? Seems not to be because there are all the mechanisms that prevent it. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so one more example, and then we can probably bring everything to a close because I think we've yeah. we've made we're making our point. But yeah. there's another interesting ERV function uh, that's very interesting to me, and it mm. actually pr protects the organism from from tumor formation uh, and from 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 tumor uh, spread. And this hmm. is a mechanism called a viral mimicry mechanism. And, and so it turns out that recently people have discovered that this mechanism is mediated through a protein called P53. And we could probably oh. do uh, a, a whole series of episodes on what P53 does. But this, long this is the, the tumor suppressor uh, protein, yeah, isn't it? Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and its nickname is the guardian of the genome. It oh. carries out all kinds of activities that protect the integrity of the genome, because if that if the p53 protein is disabled, then the genome loses its capacity to retain its integrity, and that then leads to uh, carcinogenesis, it leads to, to tumor formation. And so it turns out that uh, that p53 one of its roles is to suppress again the expression of ERVs in, in wow. and of course that again prevents retrotranspositioning from happening, which is can be highly disruptive to the integrity of the genome. Mm -hmm. But it, P53 doesn't work on its own. It works in conjunction with two other proteins. And I'm not, I don't think anybody quite knows how these proteins are working together, but the combination of these three proteins seems to, 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 to suppress ERV expression. Mm -hmm. However, when the cell becomes stressed, the level of these two companion proteins drop, and then P53, instead of suppressing ERVs, actually promotes their expression. Wow. And it, tur it turns out that this is actually a very useful mechanism because sometimes when cells become tumorgenic, when they become tumor cells, uh, they're indistinguishable from cells that are, are naturally part of the, the body, right? Mm. And, healthy somatic cells, they're indistinguishable. And so the immune system can't recognize them and clear them, clear them from the body. But it turns uh, out that when a cell is becoming, again, a tumor forming cell, becomes tumorgenic, um, it's, it's actually undergoing a, a, a stressful, it's a stressful situation, situation for the cell, which leads to a drop in these P53 companion proteins which causes P53 to then lead to the expression of ERV sequences. And as they're expressed, they're producing these GAG proteins, the e, these ENV proteins, which then work their way to the cell surface and are presented to the immune system. And it looks as if that tumor cell has been infected by a virus. And so now the cells of the immune system recognize that and attack that cell and clear it away from the system. And so people have discovered that when you activate P53 towards ERV expression in tumors, uh, that you actually see a high level of these uh, immune cells associated with the tumor that are actively clearing out these, uh, these tumor cells. So this is a mechanism wow. known as viral mimicry, where again, the sequence similarity between ERVs and retroviruses actually serves this role as a as a in a, as an anti tumor mechanism, right? As a so, tumor clearing mechanism. So the ERV the ERV now acts like uh, uh, the, the rest of the body sees the abundance of ARV replication as a viral infection and kills that tumor cell essentially. Right. Maybe yes. a T cell will pass by and this cell has so much uh, 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 transpositions happening. Let's kill it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's it's infected by a vi now. What's interesting is the researchers that discovered this are now mm. suggesting that you may actually be able to treat cancer 
with these P53 activators or these right. uh, pro molecules that would inhibit the P53 companions so that you, if you could target the, the delivery of these drugs to tumor cells, the body's immune system would clear out that tumor through this viral mimicry mechanism. So, wow. uh, you know, again, it, th this is just a very ingenious type of design that, that if you were trying to design this kind of a system, this is exactly what you would do. That, wow. that you, know, you know, far from being vestiges of, a, of an evolutionary history, you could see ERVs as, as really representing this, these elegant you know, features of the human genome or the genome of eukaryotic organisms that again uh, re reflects the, the the handiwork of a creator, the ingenuity uh, of a of a creator, you know, wow. and and just to kind of you know summarize it, that if we are going to present a, a a ID model for the occurrence of ERV sequences in genomes, and I love your point that that the ERV nomenclature already predisposes us to seeing this in evolutionary terms as opposed to seeing this as a design element, we would have to right. explain why these sequences are there. Well, we have, they're, they're functional. And, and the more that we're learning about them, the more function that functional, you know, role, functional roles that we're uh, beginning to accrue and the, the similarities between these ERV sequences and retroviruses is essentially uh, explained because that, that's critical to their functional role, particularly as part of the innate immune system. And we yeah. could then see the shared sequences, you know, in the human genome and the genomes of the great apes is reflecting common design. If a creator is going to introduce these sequences in one genome, why wouldn't he introduce them in other genomes as well? Uh, Especially if their location is actually part of the function. So maybe location similarity is not a surprise after all given that we understand what the location actually means, <laughs> which we don't, obviously. Yeah, but, but again, that's a, a type of question that I think an ID perspective would actually encourage pursuit of where an evolutionary model wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, yeah. ask those kind of questions. So, you know, the, the challenge is, you know, with, with not only ERVs, but with pseudogenes that we talked about in the previous episode, the challenge really is how do how do we communicate the the, the elegant functional role, right? Yeah. You know, uh, it, but what's interesting to me is that while you have evolutionary biologists, again, kind of adopting a, a 30, 40, 50 year old mindset with pseudogenes, with ERVs, we have people that are working in these areas at the cutting edge that are discovering function after function after function. And it's not just this haphazard function that just is a happenstance that the functionality for both pseudogenes and ERVs is really very elegant where we are able to even produce models that, it, that, it, that provide this you know, elegant explanation for why ERVs look the way they, they look and, 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 and why they function the way that they function, that it, it's just as elegant of a design as something like the, the bacterial flagellum or you know, ATP synthase or, or something like that. Wow, yeah, and, and I have maybe, maybe a final comment um, if we're wrapping up. Um, I, I don't remember coming across somebody um, you know, picking up a viral infection and becoming superhuman. And I have not come across that. I'm not sure if you can, if you have examples, maybe I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm ignorant to them. But to me, uh, infections typically cause degradation of a creature, right? If, if a creature gets infected with a virus, the viruses are not very pleasant things, right? Uh, 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 to any animal, at least. Um, so if if there are remnants of viral infections, it is not only expected that they become maybe neuter or just artifacts, it is expected that if they become activated, they cause damage, actually, because, because when the real virus was there, it causes damage, right? 
So if all what we find from the existence of ERVs is defense mechanisms, is is helping the body kill cancer, is is helping early stage protection of embryos, is this and that. And I actually, I think I have come across something in the lines of it was only possible for placental animals to exist because of ERV integration. So yeah, it says that, 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 that placental animals are diseased animals that used to lay eggs. Essentially, yeah. this is what it says. Yeah. Well, but yeah. that's another example where you have the, these proteins called syncytins that play a role in the formation of the placenta. And yeah. they, they bear a similarity to viral envelope proteins in that they're fusogenic, meaning when they, they cause two cells to fuse together to form you know, a, a larger cell. And, and this is, again, a critical part of the, the process of placental formation. Uh, and, and this is, again, a, a situation where the view is that, well, this is just a, 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 a retroviral gene that was co-opted for some other function. But when you start thinking about <laughs> what you're saying... <laughs> You know, together, together with tada, all the magic of, of having all the other equipment that are necessary for the type of sexual right. interaction that will be pertinent right. to a creature that will have the embryo inside rather than uh, yep. in a placenta rather than in a typical egg. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. it's just amazing the amount of yeah. coincidence. But, but that's another... That it, yes, exactly. Yeah, but that's another example where the similarity between the viral envelope protein and syncytin makes sense. And from a biochemical standpoint, if you were a designer, you would make them to design them to be similar proteins because they're performing similar roles. So uh, anyway, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the exciting thing is, gosh, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. And when I started at Reasons to Believe, uh, there was virtually nothing we could say about the function of junk DNA. And it's remarkable to me that, you know, in the last, you know, 25 years, I literally have seen the paradigm completely change where now, you know, it's not, it's fairly commonplace for uh, biologists to talk about uh, new function for junk, different junk DNA sequences. And, uh, I, I don't know that that 25 years ago I could have ever anticipated the kinds of discoveries that we're seeing today, uh, but it's it's mind blowing. It's absolutely mind blowing, and and you know to me it's somewhat frustrating when you have evolutionary biologists say, "Well, we we knew that junk DNA would be functional all along. We we predicted oh. this in our models," and it's like, I don't think so. I was there. 25 years ago. And I don't recall anybody making these predictions. In fact, I was seeing the opposite predictions. And, and so I, I have a challenge to people that, you know, it, it are compelled or are, are convinced by the evolutionary paradigm, particularly if you have a background in the life sciences, to show me a publication from 25 years ago, where people predicted that ERV sequences would be functional, that pseudogene sequences would be functional. Uh, if if somebody can show me those predictions, then I would be very uh, impressed. But uh, yeah. I, I, I've yet to, to find those predictions or to anybody to be able to show me those predictions. It's 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 hind, hindsight 2020, as they say, right? So after the fact, you say that the the theory would have predicted this, but the question about the power of a theory is always whether it did predict it or not. This is what you're saying. So yes. since, since it didn't predict it, you, you'd rather not say that this is this is consistent with the theory. Otherwise, why didn't you predict it beforehand? This is this is the whole question. And right. uh, yeah, I, th I think also a great lesson learned from what you've said, because um, I've not been in, I'm not a biochemist anyway, but I've, I've, I've been listening to things about um, ERVs for some time, less than 25 years, but for some time. And um, the point is, I think the lesson learned is, if you are somebody who believes that there is a creator that has designed life, including the human, and 
um, for example, the evolutionary paradigm is putting on the table a new piece of evidence that is asserting that this is the uh, ultimate knockout of any uh, um, creation alternative, um, maybe the lesson learned here is to have patience. And mm -hmm. because science will have its course and the counter evidence will surface with time because things are not typically the way they seem from the first sip, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah you so know, and, and this is a place where I think people that have held to a creation or, or an intelligent design perspective have, have really, you know, won the day in the sense that these pred predictions were made well before function was discovered for junk DNA, that eventually we would discover function for junk DNA. In fact, I can show you an article I wrote in 2000 where I made that very oh. prediction. And I, I wasn't alone. There were many, many others who held, who held to a perspective similar to mine that were making those predictions. And, and so this counts as really success for a, a creation model approach, for an ID approach, and really shows that there is uh, value in, in viewing biology from a design perspective, that it does lead to scientific progress. Absolutely. Uh... Because this was uh, quite a, uh, an interesting explanation of the ERV topic, and I think a very well needed one. So uh, I urge everybody who have watched this to share it with uh, others who have been exposed to the uh, 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 evolution from ERV argument or uh, supported by ERV's um, argument, and and to see that there is actually. Um, a completely a different story that can be said from an ID perspective or from a, a creative perspective or a designer perspective that can be more convincing and much more compelling. And if you see the trend, the trend would be that the, 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 the assignment, the, the assertions or the arguments uh, uh, are building up to the side of a creation or a design uh, argument rather than on the other way. And trend is all what counts, right? So uh, thank you very much for this. Really insightful, great information, nice presentation, and uh, plenty of research points for the future, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Ahmed. Yeah. It's it's always a lot of fun to spend time with you. So. Yeah. And, uh, and for everybody who's watched this, please look forward for the coming ones. We are going to look into more evidence for design and creation in living systems uh, supported by uh, 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 very recent discoveries and understandings of chemistry, biochemistry, and uh, molecular biology and biology. And uh, all of this with uh, uh, Faz here uh, on Seeing God in Biology. And thank you again, Faz, and see you all uh, next week, uh, God willing. So uh, peace be upon you all and till next week.